and welcome to everybody and a special big welcome to our very special guest Marco Gaiotti. We are very pleased to welcome him today to our meeting. Uh, Marco was born and raised in Genoa in Italy and in 2007 uh, he discovered almost by chance the wild environments of southern Africa and with them the passion for nature photography which drives him every year to explore the most uncontaminated habitats of our planet. In 2009 he spent a month in Alaska to observe the fauna and the spectacular local landscapes in complete autonomy, camping in the wilderness. From this experience, the desire to give a more professional tone to the passion for photography grew. Uh, in the fall of 2013, he participated in an expedition to the Svalbard Islands, just a few days before the Arctic night. And the results of this adventure are, have been translated into publications in the most important international newspapers, including last year, 2019, a double page print in the paper edition of the Guardian newspaper in Great Britain. He has been honored, as Ricardo has said, with many, many numerous awards. So I think we are in for a very, very big treat this evening uh, with some spectacular photography. But before we get into doing that, Marco, can I just say something? Uh, I see, as you say yourself, you were born in 1983 and you made your first trip in 2007. So at that stage, you were still a very young photographer. So I'm just wondering, what is it that motivates you to make your images? Uh, thank you for, for this evening. Thank you for inviting me here. I'm really happy to share with all of you my work. Um, yes, my photography actually it did not begin in, in, in 2007, but uh, nature photography for me began in 2007. I've always been traveling with my family since I was very, very young, like a child. And uh, I've always had a camera with me. So I've basically always been using a camera since I was a child. But uh, in 2007, I realized that uh, nature photography was uh, something important to me. So it took here because uh, I have to say that uh, the first uh, interesting results uh, would come, it, it almost took me 10 years to, to get something more, more interesting, but uh, it's been a very slow process uh, since the beginning. So, um, well, uh, this evening I prepared a, a, a presentation of about uh, one hour, one hour and 15 minutes, and then I am open to any questions so you can stay with me when, whenever you, you want. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, so maybe it might be a good idea, maybe Marco, for you to start sharing your screen and, and yeah. you can start going into that presentation then. Of course. Okay. Good. Okay, yep. Can you, can you see it? We can indeed, yes, thank you. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the interaction between uh, wildlife photography and habitat. Because uh, when, you think, when you think about wildlife, um, usually it's uh, all about uh, animal species, but uh, we forget that uh, animals uh, uh, need uh, an environment to live. And um, when uh, I started uh, my, my photography career, I was actually a landscape photographer. So uh, I spent years uh, learning landscape photography and uh, scouting for the best uh, locations. And uh, so I had this uh, uh, big, uh, big part of my career uh, spent to be a wildlife photographer. And uh, when I decided that I preferred wildlife photography, um, I kept all this knowledge with me and uh, try to combine the two different uh, styles. Um, well, but uh, as I said today, this evening, I want to talk uh, about uh, a habitat because uh, if we look at uh, conservation, 
habitat loss is a, a very serious threat to several species because according to the uh, IUCN red list, 85% uh, of the species included in the red list are threatened by habitat loss. So we always think about poaching, we always think about hunting, but the real problem is that uh, we are consuming our planet, we are consuming the space in our planet due to human pressure, due to human expansion. So basically, even if, if we decide uh, to protect the species, uh, but uh, if we do not protect uh, the, the relative habitat, then we have uh, a big problem concerning conservation. And I can also add that um, a lot of species, uh, we, we will see some of them during this presentation, that are currently not considered endangered, uh, are facing uh, big drops in their populations. So, uh, and this is mostly need to changes in the, in the habitat or to the complete destruction uh, of the habitat. So the disappearing habitat, uh, mostly due to human consumption, um, makes uh, the, the present distribution of wildlife uh, uh, particularly scattered. So we are isolating a local population and this is also uh, accelerating the uh, extinction of, uh, of several spaces. This is a um, Sumatran orangutan from Sumatra Island. This is a wild animal. Um, by the way, over the years, um, I tried to develop my personal style aiming at including uh, composition elements uh, that were highly correlated to the habitat uh, in which the, the species is inserted. Um, so as I said, uh, uh, since, I was, uh, since I started as a landscape photographer, uh, I simply enjoyed to, um, to photograph the landscape and put some animals inside like uh, in, this, uh, in this picture from uh, Hokkaido where I was attracted by, by the mountains in the, in the background and then I, I found these deer in, in the foreground. Uh, so the, the habitat itself uh, an important element in the frame, which is uh, absolutely um, not, uh, where it is absolutely not possible to separate uh, um, the reading of the image uh, between the animal and the background. It's a, a combination of both. Um, the subject of the picture is not just the animal, but it's also the, the habitat of the, uh, of the species, uh, like this uh, bird here in the uh, swamps of uh, Louisiana, uh, or this uh, uh, brown bear in, uh, in Alaska at, uh, at sunrise. I also like, like quite a lot the interaction between several species, uh, uh, so where the habitat is rich of, of many species. Um, but uh, this uh, project, we, we could call it photo project because it, this is uh, where I am mostly active at the moment. Um, it did not start with any conservation purpose. I simply uh, enjoyed the uh, the results. I looked at the image and said, "Oh yeah, wow, it's nice. It, uh, it looks interesting uh, because uh, you have more options. You have more degrees of freedom." I, I, I'm an engineer, so I like talking uh, with this uh, uh, this comparison. Um, the more option you have, the more you can be creative. And uh, sometimes, if you only are focused on the animal then you, uh, you have uh, limited possibilities. While if you have a wider view, you can include uh, uh, quite a lot of the surrounding uh, environments. Uh, like this uh, giraffe in the, uh, the Mesdemara National Reserve. Um, I like uh, using quite a lot uh, uh, wide angle lenses uh, when it's possible, of course, uh, and not be uh, a good option for all the species, but uh, uh, when you can get uh, quite close, when it's safe for both you and the animal to get close, uh, I really like uh, to, to use uh, wide angle lenses like uh, 16 to 35 and uh, to uh, compose the frame uh, using all the elements I have in the, in the composition. 
like this uh, uh, big storm in the uh, in the background behind the, the giraffe in the rainy season. Um, so I, it did not start as a, um, as a conservation project uh, because I simply enjoyed the results. I enjoyed mixing elements of landscape photography with uh, wildlife inside. Uh, but then over the years, I realized how these uh, habitats are actually shrinking and uh, how little has remained in nature um, so I thought that uh, I could help conservation with, uh, with photography. I could show people that uh, we're not just losing wildlife, we're, we're losing everything. We are uh, losing the, um, the environment. And um, as you can see from this uh, picture, this is a very beautiful national park in Kenya. Um, it is Lake Nakuru National Park. Uh, I took this uh, satellite image from Google and uh, I realized that uh, between the city, uh, you, see, uh, you see the red line, um, the city is pushing the, the national park towards the lake and there is only a 250 meters corridor to let uh, wildlife uh, uh, move in the, in the national park. So there is really uh, very little left in, uh, in nature. Uh, so when I realized that uh, all these natural habitats uh, were shrinking and they were sh shrinking, shrinking extremely uh, quickly, uh, especially in some uh, regions like Africa, uh, I thought that uh, um, this project could also be uh, an interesting work for, for conservation. Or another uh, very endangered uh, environment uh, is uh, this one in Ethiopia, the Simian Mountains. Um, it's, a, it's a national park, but uh, um, it's actually um, highly inhabited by people. And uh, there are villages uh, with uh, cattle everywhere. The government tried to, um, to, to limit the human expansion there. But uh, if you travel to this uh, national park, which is a very, very beautiful area, you will see that there is only a very small strip on, uh, of land on top of the mountains at altitudes from 3,500 to uh, 4,000 uh, and more meters side where you can, uh, uh, you can find uh, wildlife. Um, this is one of the rarest uh, uh, species on earth. It's the uh, Walia ibex. Uh, only 400 uh, of these animals remain in the wild. And uh, uh, I think it's interesting, the interaction with the, uh, the monkeys, the, the Gelada da Bupabun, which is a very beautiful uh, species of monkey, uh, also highly endemic to, to Ethiopia. So if, uh, if this has habitat disappear, uh, which is already very small, uh, we're going to lose uh, both species in, in a few years. Uh, this is again a, a Gelada da Bupabun depicted in, in backlight in, uh, in early morning. Um, and this is uh, the environment as it looks like. Uh, you see these monkeys, these monkeys live uh, uh, on, the, on the very top of the mountains. Uh, and uh, you see in the background, all the villages, uh, uh, it's all cultivated land. So there is no space for landscape, for, for wildlife. And uh, only the very top of the mountain is, uh, is, is still a, a national park. Um, this is a very beautiful uh, place. Uh, this is the, the kind of photography that I like, where you can truly, um, truly combine uh, wildlife uh, uh, photos with uh, uh, the amazing uh, uh, background. Um, yeah, Siemens Mountains are currently facing a, a growing human pressure, and uh, you can really, uh, you can really see it uh, everywhere in, in that area. Uh, anyway, this is the. Uh, the style of photography that I prefer when you have uh, a relaxed animal that you can easily approach. Uh, this uh, photo was taken at 16 millimeters uh, of focal length. So I was extremely close to the monkey, less, left, less than 40 centimeters probably. And uh, the, the animal was completely relaxed. I could uh, stay with him for, for minutes and uh, absolutely an easy situation. Uh, in this uh, this morning, I used uh, a very uh, a very hard uh, flashlight to because um, the 
the sunrise um, was quite early that morning and monkeys are a bit lazy. So I decided to try a different uh, non-natural light to, uh, to have this dark background in the, uh, in the background of the image that I think it's quite interesting. Uh, other species uh, I've, uh, I've been uh, working with is this uh, black crested macaque in Tancoco National Park. Uh, this is one of the most endemic species on Earth. It lives in a very, very small area. Uh, you can see from, uh, from the picture to the right uh, on the tip of Sulawesi Island. Uh, there are only a few groups of these uh, monkeys left in nature. Uh, so this is another very uh, highly uh, endangered, uh, endangered animal. Uh, again, I use the 16 millimeters focal length uh, and uh, this is a bit more challenging to, to get close, but uh, after one week, I, I learned how to approach this, uh, this kind of animal. Uh, and of course, if we talk about, if we talk about conservation, uh, Madagascar is another very, uh, very interesting place uh, because uh, uh, most of the forest uh, uh, were completely destroyed over the last uh, 40 years. Uh, but now there are some, uh, um, some conservation projects that uh, have, have started and uh, a lot of efforts has been put in place to uh, at least to restore part of the uh, original forest. And uh, here I, I try to use a, um, an high key technique to uh, show the texture of the palm uh, behind this, uh, um, this lemur. Uh, this is another very rare kind of lemur. It's uh, uh, considered critically endangered. Uh, most of the uh, lemurs you will see in the next few images are uh, critically endangered uh, species, uh, like this uh, Indri. Again, uh, um, the, the problem with these animals is the, the loss of the habitat because uh, yes, there is some hunting, but it's not that uh, that much critical. But uh, the habitat loss is uh, is a big problem for uh, for lemurs. And uh, again, uh, with a with a wide angle uh, lens, uh, it's uh, interesting to to depict also the background and the uh, the environment where these animals are are inserted. Um, here, I was quite lucky because uh, it's quite rare to see these uh, animals uh, on land. Uh, they stay quite high on trees all day, but uh, uh, that one decided to, to climb down because uh, they sometimes they need to eat mud because they eat uh, uh, quite poisonous, poisonous leaves. So to, in order to clean their body, they need to eat a little bit of mud sometimes. And, uh, I was lucky enough to, to see the slammer uh, climbing down the, the tree and uh, eating mud just uh, a, few, uh, a few meters away from me. And this is another uh, of, the, of the same species with its uh, natural uh, background. Uh, sometimes I like also to try some uh, more artistic effects. <laughs> um, after spending one week in the, in the rainforest, uh, uh, where it was raining every day. Um, I went to a different place and uh, uh, I decided to use a, a very wide aperture, uh, like 15 millimeters f1.2. And uh, I started to photograph this lemur. And then I realized that uh, the lens was completely steamed from, from the inside uh, after the, the rainforest experience. But uh, I think the result was, uh, was quite interesting because it created this uh, very uh, soft background with, uh, with nice lights. So I, I decided to keep the, the image. And uh, yeah, the project then continued in, in Sumatra. Uh, this is uh, one of the most, uh, most critical area, uh, areas of the planet concerning habitat loss. Uh, you can see uh, on the left how uh, primary forest uh, uh, shrank uh, since the beginning of the last century. 
and uh, also this uh, process uh, uh, accelerated quite uh, quite a lot due to uh, pine palm oil, oil uh, plantations over the last few years. Um, and so um, the problem with these populations um, is that uh, since there are very high mountains in this area, uh, those areas are supposed to remain uh, quite, uh, quite, quite wild. It's not possible to cultivate there. But um, the problem is that uh, um, you isolate the, the populations of the orangutan, um, the density of the orangutans uh, is quite low in nature. So uh, when you isolate population, they have to interbreed. And uh, this is a serious threat for their, for their conservation. The, uh, the species become much weaker. Uh, so it's a very, I think it's very important to have a, a, a large continuous habitat and not uh, several scattered uh, areas that isolate the, the populations. And uh, yeah, also this was a very uh, lucky, lucky situation. This is a very, uh, this is a wild uh, orangutan. It was not used to, to seeing people. I, uh, I hiked in the forest for uh, five days before uh, we met him. And uh, it, it was curious. It uh, probably, it was not used to, to seeing humans and uh, uh, when he spotted us, he decided to climb down and uh, slowly, gently approach. And uh, uh, after about one hour, we, we managed to, to get quite close and to, to use the wide angle. And this is also quite an unusual behavior for uh, Sumatran orangutans. They, uh, they, they hardly uh, climb down trees because there are tigers in this area. So they, uh, even if there are very few tigers, they uh, are quite scared of... Uh, of climbing down the trees. But uh, back to Ethiopia, uh, there is another very uh, rare animal, uh, also uh, like, like the Walia ibex, uh, uh, there are only 400 of these animals estimated to be in the wild. And uh, one place where it's quite easy to, to meet them is the uh, Bali Mountains a National Park, in particular in the Saneti Plateau. Uh, this is a very surreal uh, landscape. It's uh, quite high, uh, more than 4,000 meters high. It's uh, quite flat, but you have this uh, uh, surreal vegetation. Uh, the grass is, uh, is white. It, it is sometimes frosty in the morning, but uh, it's uh, naturally white, and you have this uh, uh, red uh, wolf. Uh, it's, a, it's a wild wolf, it's an Ethiopian wolf uh, that uh, uh, stands uh, just uh, on, uh, on front of this uh, white vegetation. I think it's a very nice uh, color contrast. And uh, yes, also here it's been depicted in the, the mist, uh, which makes the, the image quite, uh, quite surreal. Uh, uh, about wildlife photography, this is, uh, uh, on the contrary, a very a very difficult species to, to approach. Um, it's really, really hard to, to take nice shots of this uh, animal. It's extremely shy. Uh, doesn't want to, to see people and usually they, they run away as soon as they, uh, they notice your, your presence. So it, it's been quite a challenging experience, but uh, I'm pretty happy with, this, with this, these two images. And Ethiopia is, uh, is much more than uh, uh, mammals. Uh, there are also very uh, interesting birds. Uh, this is another image that uh, uh, describes quite, uh, quite a lot my style. Um, this is a rupelled vulture, which is a critically endangered species. And uh, in the background, you see the, the Jinbar waterfalls, which is truly uh, impressive because it uh, falls from the plateau uh, at 4,000 meters down to the valley and uh, in the rainy season, it's uh, truly impressive. And uh, all these vultures, uh, there are also bearded vultures in this area. Um, they gather and they uh, start flying the, uh, about at noon when the wind began to begin to flow down from the valley and uh, they lift them up. Uh, so I tried to uh, to have uh, uh, an image uh, culture 
just in front of the uh, of the waterfall. So to uh, to have a quite uh, picture with uh, um, with all the background quite dark and the the stream of water uh, on the right and uh, and the vulture on on the left. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, this this image is quite nice. Uh, of course, when we talk about uh, possibilities, uh, when we talk about uh, habitat, uh, uh, water uh, gives, uh, uh, it opens a lot of possibilities uh, towards photography because uh, we add, we can add elements uh, to, to the composition. So especially misty water can be, uh, can be really nice. Uh, I'm, I'm basically, a, wildlife photographer, but I also like some, some land, landscapes of photos. Uh, as I said, this is from, uh, from China from two years ago. Uh, or this uh, is a blue heron in the uh, swamp of uh, Louisiana. I truly like the, uh, the background with uh, the, the cypress uh, barely visible uh, through the mist. And um, yeah, when we talk about uh, weather, of course, snow is a very interesting uh, uh, opportunity. And uh, this uh, red fox uh, depicted in heavy winds, uh, I think was really nice. And this is from Hokkaido, uh, when very, very windy morning. Or back to Ethiopia again, the, the thunderstorms. Uh, you know, in, in Africa, it's not easy to have very good lights because uh, uh, the sun, after the sunrise, it goes straight up quickly. And uh, basically you have uh, 10 to 15 minutes of uh, magic lights every sunrise and 10 to 15 minutes every sunset every day, uh, which is not much. But uh, sometimes uh, uh, when the weather is not good, when we have these uh, uh, lights, breaking through the clouds, uh, uh, you can have more, more possibilities. And uh, this is also the reason why I prefer the, the rainy season in Africa, because in the dry season, uh, with clear skies, uh, uh, there is too little to, uh, it, the, the time window for taking photos, I think it's too, too small. Uh, you risk to, to waste your time. While in the, rain, in the rainy season, there are usually uh, several more options. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, the snow, as we said, is, uh, is a very interesting opportunity. Uh, this is um, uh, sometimes uh, you don't need to have uh, a real snow uh, to take this kind of photos. Uh, I think the best uh, is when you have fresh snow being blown by the wind. Because uh, if it's uh, just snow, then when it's snowing, uh, you don't, you cannot uh, get uh, any backlit. It's, uh, it's difficult to have good light because it's usually, it's usually dark and it's, uh, everything is completely white. Uh, but this morning, um, we had a fresh snowfall the, the day before. Uh, this is from Svalbard, so from a very cold environment. And um, I, uh, th there was some heavy wind blowing and I realized that I could uh, put uh, myself between the sun and the, and the fox. Uh, so uh, you see so much snow because the wind, the, the sun is behind the fox. And this uh, helps showing the, the texture of the, of the snowflakes. Yeah, this is instead a more typical uh, snowy situation with uh, uh, red crown cranes in, uh, in Hokkaido. Uh, you, you see the, the snow, you see the texture, but it's not, uh, so, so special as uh, the one before with, with the fox. And also uh, mist um, is an, another interesting option considering the environment, especially when it's uh, very low and you have some uh, uh, sun uh, passing through, through the mist, creating this very soft atmosphere. Uh, this is from another place that I really, uh, really like quite a lot. It's, uh, uh, Lake Kusharo in, uh, in Hokkaido, in eastern Hokkaido. And uh, here um, there are some uh, um, volcanoes in, in the area and uh, it's uh, common to, 
to find the hot springs. And it's also a very cold environment. Uh, I experienced temperature like minus 35 in this area in, in January. So it's a very, very cold place. But uh, uh, if you go nearby the hot springs, uh, a lot of birds gather in the relative water because it's, it's cold everywhere else. And uh, it's easy to, to find uh, swans uh, gathering at those uh, springs. We have a lot of smokes from, uh, from the hot springs. And this is the, uh, the place in a, different, uh, um, in a different situation. We have a uh, heavy snowfall and the sun behind uh, the snow. This is quite a natural situation. Uh, you see the, the hot spring in the, uh, in the background here to, to the left, where you see the, the smokes. Um, Hokkaido is also interesting because it uh, snows quite a lot, but uh, uh, also the weather can change uh, quickly. So you can have uh, uh, snow passing by and uh, the sun a few minutes later, which uh, changes the, 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 the environment quite a lot. But uh, sometimes uh, mm, it's not just about the uh, uh, the, the weather, the, the, the weather like mist and clouds and uh, thunderstorms, sometimes uh, it's a dry, uh, it's a dry land and a uh, herd of elephant that uh, uh, creates this uh, dusty situation in the, in the Serengeti. And uh, in this case, I truly enjoy the contrast between the, um, the green and lushy vegetation of, uh, of palm in the background and the uh, dry land with the elephant. Um, in the, in the back, in the, in the foreground. So this is another quite interesting uh, contrast, I think. And of course, uh, uh, misty situation like uh, Louisiana are truly, truly amazing also for landscape uh, opportunities. Um, again, uh, lions are common animals. They've been photographed uh, from any angle, from any distance. Uh, uh, but uh, one morning, this is from uh, uh, last November, um, not, not actually this November, November 2019, uh, where we found this uh, interesting background in the, uh, over the Mara River, uh, we have a thick mist in the morning, and uh, I tried to, to, use it, to use it as a background for this uh, old lion. Uh, this is a very iconic uh, lion. It's the uh, famous uh, uh, Scarface lion. Uh, with, uh, the, a lot of documentaries have been filmed about this, uh, um, about this old lion. It only has uh, one eye. Uh, it's blind on, on one eye. And it's uh, very, very old and probably almost uh, close to, to the end of his, his life. Uh, but uh, I, I liked it, the contrast between the uh, the sun in the foreground and this, uh, and then the situation a few hours later, uh, we we encountered this uh, very uh, severe uh, in uh, in the Masai Mara. Uh, so again, it's the the weather that uh, adds uh, quite a lot to the, to the environment. Or uh, this is another image that uh, it's one of the first uh, habitat project. Uh, it's a quite old image uh, with, uh, with a wide angle lens again, 16 millimeters. I like the uh, matter uh, and the, the, the calf on the uh, on the left, and uh, also you see the sky that uh, on the right, on the right side uh, uh, it's uh, yellow, and the other side is blue. So it's uh, also, the colors are quite uh, quite nice. Uh, but then, um, I, I realized that when we talk about uh, uh, disappearing habitat, it's not just about uh, uh, direct human pressure. Human pressures. It's not just because we cut forests or we uh, use the land. Uh, some Sometimes uh, uh, some changes uh, due to human activities also occur in areas that uh, 
are not uh, actually populated by humans. So uh, I also spent quite a lot of time to, to photograph the Arctic uh, over the last few years. Uh, I managed to travel twice to the Arctic uh, last summer in, in Svalbard. And uh, the, the, the seasonal changes you, you see there are, are pretty Im impressive. And also the uh, impact of, uh, of climate change is, uh, is quite, uh, it's quite impressive. Um, I, I went here the first time eight years ago, and then I, I try to return every year uh, whenever it's possible because I truly uh, think it truly fits my, my project. Uh, so uh, the big problem here is that uh, several Arctic species, like in example, the polar bears, uh, they depend on the sea ice to, to survive. Um, so the, the, the lack of sea ice uh, um, is posing a threat to, to survival of, uh, of, of such species. It's not just about polar bears, it's about uh, uh, seals, it's about uh, a lot of species of calcium, it's about uh, uh, waters. So um, all, all these animals, they, they need ice. And uh, yeah, this is a, a backlight, backlit photo uh, from Vitoya Island in, uh, in Eastern uh, Svalbard. Uh, but um, I like to, to travel to these areas uh, also in, uh, in winter. Um, and uh, in winter, you can have really uh, impressive landscape, uh, like this uh, uh, image of, um, of a polar bear hunting for uh, seals in the um, in, in, in one of the fjord uh, of, um, of Svalbard. And uh, well, it's uh, the, the colors uh, in the mid seasons uh, are truly amazing in the Arctic. Uh, we said that uh, in Africa, you have uh, like uh, 15, 20 minutes of good lights per day. Uh, but if you travel to the Arctic in, uh, um, in March, April or in September, August, September, uh, you have hours, you see hours of, uh, of magic lights. So I truly enjoy to, to travel to these areas at the end of the winter uh, when it's uh, still uh, everything completely frozen and uh, uh, see a lot of uh, amazing lights. And you also see a lot of interaction between uh, species. Um, the, we, we said that uh, we, we are facing problems with the lack of ice. Uh, and uh, another big problem is that um, the ice melts completely in the summertime. So uh, when the new ice reforms uh, the next winter, um, there is no ice left from the previous season. So the, the surface of the water, of the frozen water is completely flat and even. And when seals are, are born, um, their mother, abandon or actually leave the seals on the ice and seals uh, can only count on um, uh, on the fact that uh, it is uh, white like the background so the camouflage it's it's their only defense against polar um, it's been observed that uh, without this multi-year ice uh, it's easier for polar bears to, to locate baby seals uh, which is at the moment good for bears, but uh, it's not good for conservation of their prey, which is seals. So in, in some fjords, uh, um, it's been observed that all the newborn seals have been killed by polar bears, like in this case here. Uh, and the bird you see in the, in the background, it's an, it's an ivory gull, which is another very beautiful uh, Arctic bird that uh, uh, eats uh, the, the leftovers of, of polar bears. Uh, this is a polar bear uh, image from, from last summer. Uh, sometimes uh, um, this is probably the only black and white uh, uh, image I have in my portfolio. Uh, the light was not good, so I decided to focus on shapes and composition. And uh, uh, I think that the water that uh, drops uh, of its fur, it's, uh, it's pretty nice. Um, so when uh, uh, we said that uh, Polar bears need, uh, uh, need sea ice to, to hunt 
And uh, when the sea ice melts, they can only uh, rest and, uh, and wait for the return of the ice uh, the next winter. Uh, not all the bears uh, uh, get stranded on land in, uh, in the summertime. Uh, some of them, uh, they follow the, the retreat of the sea ice towards the North Pole. But uh, for those uh, who get stranded, they can only uh, count on their fat reserves. So they have to, to sit and wait and uh, save energy. Uh, the longer is the wait, uh, the higher is the chance of, uh, of starving because uh, uh, they can uh, stay some months without any, any food available. But uh, in some years, uh, uh, where, where the, when the sea ice melts too early, and uh, by too early, I mean like uh, April, May, uh, maybe late May, June sometimes, but uh, it will not uh, likely return before uh, December or January sometimes. So it's a very long time without any, any food available. And uh, yes, this is a, this is a picture of a, of a starving bear. I, I truly enjoyed the mood of this image of the white uh, starving bear with this uh, black background of uh, uh, black rocks uh, behind uh, the bear. This is taken in northern Svalbard uh, a few years ago. And uh, also you see how desolate is the, the place where, where this animal uh, are forced to live in the summertime. Uh, basically they, they cannot find any food uh, unless they, they find some carcass like uh, oil carcass. Uh, here um, there was a, a whale carcass and uh, with seven polar bears uh, in the, the area. Um, I like to, to combine the shape of the, um, and the colors of the background with these uh, lines of, uh, of different colors. I think this is quite, uh, quite interesting uh, image uh, considering the uh, different lines of uh, shape and colors and the two bears. Uh, this is um, a mother with, uh, with a cup. I'm sorry. So it's um, it's quite uncertain the the future of this uh, uh, Arctic environment, but uh, probably uh, well probably there there's still a chance for, for these animals they can uh, adapt to to, to changing situations. They are more more keen on preying bird colonies in the summer, so they are learning new, new strategies to survive. But uh, anyway, we, we, we have a problem in the Arctic, not just about the, the polar bears. Now I, I show you uh, other, um, other species that are uh, quite in, in danger there. Uh, this is uh, another very old photo uh, where I realized that uh, in that situation, uh, using a wide angle could, could be more, uh, more interesting than, than a photo, telephoto lens. Um, I was on a boat with um, a lot of photographers, uh, most of them using long lenses, but uh, then I realized that uh, uh, a wide angle could uh, really um, show a different situation. Uh, well, this is actually the perfect environment for polar bears. They are uh, on the drifting ice. Uh, that's, uh, that's what they like, actually. So sometimes people ask, ask me about uh, uh, the, the sad feeling of this image, but uh, this is actually a very healthy and a very happy bear because this is what they like. The problem is when there is no, no drifting ice. Uh, this year, uh, I had the chance of uh, visiting a, a, a walrus colony uh, twice, and uh, it was a very nice experience. Uh, um, these animals are very curious. Uh, not very easy to, to approach them, but uh, they are extremely cute. So they, they will try to approach you, but sometimes it's, it's not safe. Um, anyway, um, in this bay, I managed to visit this, uh, this colony uh, the first time at the uh, mid of the Arctic summer in July. So it was, uh, this, this image was taken at midnight. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, the light is good, but it's still, uh, quite sunny and uh, we had this, uh, it was a very humid day with a lot of mist. So I tried to use the lines 
in the, in the background that shows the the glaciers and to to compose the the waters with these uh, lines uh, in the in the background to depict the whole habitat of the of the waters and then later this is a more documentary image i uh, sat down on the beach and uh, uh, wait for the waters it was very curious and it began to approach me so using a, a short lens I could uh, capture also the the background behind these uh, uh, these very interesting animals. Uh, with a long lens, it's uh, it's it's nice. You can also work in silhouette, but it's uh, you know it's, uh, it's quite limited. You have uh, far less opportunities, and it's uh, this kind of style has been already uh, seen quite a lot. So it's better to, to mix new new elements to uh, introduce something new in in photography whenever it is possible. And this is the same colony um, a few months later uh, when the, um, this is uh, in September. So it's uh, the end of the Arctic summer when uh, the uh, midnight sun has gone and uh, the polar night is, is approaching. Um, and uh, you see all these uh, curious animals in, uh, in the line all approaching me with the uh, nice uh, uh, background with the uh, Spitsbergen mountains in, uh, at, at the back of the frame. And this is probably even, uh, even better. Uh, I put my, um, 30, I, I, I couldn't use, I was using the, the 16 to 35 in this image, uh, but I realized that 16 was a bit too much and uh, uh, it was also quite uh, challenging to, to focus the, the animal when it was too close uh, because as you can see this is a very dynamic uh, scene you see the the task of the uh, of the war was splashing the water so uh, I realized that uh, 16 millimeters was uh, a bit uh, too wide uh, and uh, I set the lens to 25 and uh, yeah, I tried to, to take this kind of shots. I had, uh, I was holding my, my camera uh, with my left hand and the back of the hand was in the water. So I could feel where the water was and uh, uh, I was really shooting at uh, the water level. I almost dropped my, my camera into the water, but uh, I think the, the low angle uh, is, uh, is quite nice. Uh, I like all the Arctic uh, animals, uh, this uh, musk ox here. Um, the good thing with the Arctic, as we said, is that the light generally, uh, unless it's cloudy or unless it's uh, unless the weather is too bad, uh, on good days, the, the good light uh, uh, lasts for, for hours. So I especially like uh, uh, months like uh, um, in the Arctic, uh, uh, when you're close to the equinox, it's, it's a good period to be there. Uh, a bit further to the south, so also winter, like uh, in this case uh, here in Norway, uh, has pretty, pretty nice light. And um, also here, this is a Svalbard uh, reindeer with uh, a very nice uh, uh, sunset uh, background. Uh, sometimes the environment is also about the, the rainbows, uh, this is an Arctic turn with, uh, with nice colors in, uh, in the background. This is just uh, taken, taken absolutely by chance. I actually didn't, uh, well, I could see the rainbow, but uh, uh, it's not easy to, to put the moving bird just in front of the rainbow, but I was quite lucky to, to make it. Very beautiful uh, Arctic animal is the the, the This is a very special uh, mammal. It's one of the very few uh, land mammals that uh, live in the, in the Arctic, and um, it's uh, it's really really nice to, to photograph it in winter. Uh, it's um, on that morning it was extremely cold, and uh, yeah, the this fox was calling other. Uh, individuals uh, of uh, of the same species, 
and uh, it was so cold that uh, it was so cold that uh, uh, after calling, you could see that the breath of the of the fox uh, of the fox freezing in the air. Uh, on that day, it was minus 30, 34, so it was very very cold. And uh, yeah, I decided to stay back late and try to, to photograph this uh, this phenomenon. Uh, again, the same situation I described before. We have uh, a lot of uh, snowflakes in, in the air. This is one year later. Uh, same fox, probably. But also in, um, uh, you know, also uh, trying to include the, the Arctic habitat, I think it's, uh, it's interesting. And uh, uh, one day I, uh, I found this uh, uh, fox in its uh, summer dress, you see in this case, it, it is not white. Uh, it was crossing a big uh, a blue ice glacier in, uh, in Svalbard. And uh, I tried to, uh, to photograph the, the fox silhouette uh, and uh, the blue ice uh, uh, on the, the bottom of the frame. And uh, yes, this is another, um, another photo that uh, really uh, fit my, my project. Here with uh, a yawning <laughs> fox in, uh, in, in Svalbard in, in winter time. And as we said in the Arctic, uh, uh, there are some animals that uh, uh, still look quite, uh, quite abundant. Uh, this is a very common bird, um, not the, not this one. This is an Arctic tern. It's a different one. But uh, all these birds you see here are kittiwakes, and the uh, kittiwakes uh, are very, very, very common birds. But if you talk to scientists, uh, they describe a really uh, critical situation uh, with uh, populations of uh, kittiwakes that dropped dramatically over the last 10 years. Uh, they still don't know why, but uh, although it's a very, very common bird, I, uh, still a very common bird, uh, it's probably one of the mostly uh, critically endangered species in the Arctic. And here I decided to, um, to combine this uh, flock of birds. Uh, I, I saw this uh, beautiful blue iceberg in, in Monaco Glacier. Uh, the ice here is extremely blue because it's um, it comes from very old glaciers where uh, basically they have no air uh, entrapped inside, and that's the reason why they are so blue. And uh, I I thought I, I, I thought it was very interesting the uh, the lines the diagonal lines in the in the ice, and tried to to photograph the ice with the the kitty wakes in front. So it's. Uh, uh, I think that this is a good combination of both uh, a nice image uh, and uh, also uh, a conservation story about uh, about kittiwakes. Uh, other Arctic animals are like this. Um, this is more detailed, so it's not uh, that much uh, fitting my, my project. But I like this uh, this Arctic hare with uh, uh, the red uh, red leaf in in winter. Um, about my, my personal photography, um, I've, uh, I'm more, actually I am describing a, basically a conservation project, but uh, as I said, it didn't start as a conservation project and I've always been more attracted by the artistic side of, uh, of photography. Um, so I tried to develop my personal uh, style uh, and of course I have in influence from painting. I have always been fascinating, fascinated by uh, Flemish painters or the Italian Caravaggio with a lot of uh, uh, strong contrast, uh, uh, some warm saturated colors like this uh, reds you see in this uh, image. And I think that also the direction of the, of the light is, uh, is very important. Uh, I like images with uh, a lot of pictorial uh, elements like this, uh, uh, red uh, autumn leaves you see in, in the background. This is a brown bear in, in Alaska. And uh, I really like this, uh, um, this dark uh, photos with uh, uh, some red spots of colors and also the diagonal lines of the uh, branch in, in the background. 
or as we said, the, the direction of light is, is very important. Uh, uh, this is from the Atchafalaya Swamp in, in Louisiana with uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, shafts of light uh, breaking through a misty morning in, in Louisiana. And, yeah, as we said, I, I like the contrast uh, and uh, whenever uh, we have uh, uh, a dark background and uh, saturated colors like yellows and, and red, I think the, the image becomes uh, quite, uh, quite powerful. Uh, this is uh, a leopard, which is a very common animal um, in the Serengeti, but uh, I think the, the surrounding environment, the surrounding habitat of this uh, animal is, uh, is pretty nice. Yeah, this is this is probably one of my favorite uh, uh, image I took in the last few years. Um, I this was a very uh, lucky shot because uh, I realized that uh, uh, there was this interesting background. We have um, uh, you see this uh, uh, red uh, this red vegetation starting to display some autumn colors and. Uh, there's like a triangle just above the bears. So I was uh, I was in the river uh, with uh, uh, long waders, and um, I realized that there were two bear fightings on the other side, uh, but um, they were not in this position when the fight started. Uh, I already had uh, several shots of uh, of fights. <laughs> So I put the camera on the tripod and uh, I started to think uh, of the composition for the background. And, uh, and I said, okay, uh, I don't care about the more, uh, shots of uh, just two bears fighting. I want uh, the bears fighting with exactly this background. Uh, they can fight for minutes. So you can, uh, if you follow the action, uh, it's, uh, they move quite a lot. So it, it's a situation that can happen. So I decided to put the camera on the tripod to compose the frame and wait for the bears. And uh, yeah, after a few minutes, they uh, came exactly to, to where I, I wanted. So uh, I think this, uh, this background is so nice just because I uh, thought of the, uh, of the environment of the, of the background before uh, shooting the animal. And just by chance, the, the animal came exactly here. Uh, there are a lot of magic uh, places with uh, that offers uh, interesting opportunities. Environment. This is another place that I truly love. It's the uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much wildlife here, but uh, the the environment is truly amazing with this uh, uh, dark mood and uh, these uh, red flowers uh, on land and. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very special place. It's not, uh, it's not big, it's not a big area, but uh, I always want to spend a few days uh, whenever I travel to Ethiopia to, to this place because it's, uh, it's super good. And back to uh, environment, uh, back to uh, images that look like painting. Uh, yeah, this is another interesting uh, uh, combination of uh, um, of the landscape uh, with uh, uh, a lot of uh, lot of uh, wildlife inserted inside. Um, you see, we, we we this also uh, says a lot uh, about the interaction between different species, because uh, the the gulls you see here are waiting for for the leftovers uh, of the bear. The, the bear is fishing for salmon and. Uh, uh, yes, after the, it will leave something for, for the girls. So uh, you see a lot of uh, life uh, happening here uh, at the waterfall. Um, yeah, this is another place where I like to, to spend some time. You can uh, use slow shadow speed, like uh, one over 10, one over 30. Uh, in most cases, the, uh, the camera shake will not uh, uh, result into a good image, but um, when it works, it's, uh, it's a pretty nice result. Or, yeah, this is another very special place to me, the, the, the Louisiana swamps with this uh, uh, very 
three nice backgrounds. We have uh, uh, bold cypress and uh, this uh, this bird, this white bird, taking off just uh, in front of this uh, uh, this landscape. And this is another very uh, very lucky image. Um, I visited China last year, and uh, I wasn't really sure to uh, concerning wildlife. wasn't really sure sure of what I would have found there. Uh, it's not easy to uh, to talk with the Chinese guides to describe what you want, what to expect. So. I, with a friend of mine, we, we decided to take this trip and have a look there. And um, I visited this area for, for the landscape opportunities. Uh, you see these nice peaks, but uh, on that morning, the, the light was really bad. It was quite uh, uh, cloudy, so nothing interesting. Uh, we were just uh, talking about the possible compositions for, for the landscape. Uh, when uh, when this macaque uh, suddenly appeared in front of my camera, so uh, we actually did not even know that, that the uh, monkey is there, and it was very uh, a very nice uh, surprise that morning. Or again, the, this uh, uh, in the same trip, uh, uh, this uh, giant panda in its, uh, its green environment. It's, uh, it's actually not uh, truly wild photos. It's, uh, there are some areas where pandas live in a semi-wild environment. It's frankly impossible to get permission to, to photograph a real wild panda. But there are some places that have nice, uh, uh, nice, uh, nice environment that looks like uh, a wild one. And uh, again, uh, this mixing of uh, um, Wildlife photos with, uh, with background can uh, can give rise to nice opportunities. Um, sometimes uh, I use the um, the multiple exposure techniques to um, to improve the the colors of the images, the images in, in, especially in the uh, blurred part of the frame. So in this case, I added uh, two um, two images taken at the same time. Uh, one blurred, uh, uh, focusing on the on the red leaves, uh, displaying autumn colors to improve the uh, the foreground. Uh, anyway, as as I said, I'm more on the artistic side of photography, so I truly enjoy uh, surreal, surreal images, um, abstract photos, uh, details, uh, and. Uh, Yes, uh, we have a lot of texture are, are something that uh, I, I really like. This is from uh, Okai in, in Japan. Or, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, I got the message that I'm losing connection. Can you hear me? Yes, at the moment we can hear you, but you did break up a little bit there uh, when you're speaking about the last image. Hello, Marco. Okay, okay. Now, now it's okay. Yes, now it's okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, no problem. Hello. Hello, Marco. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This. Yeah. Very well. Okay. Yeah, so uh, this is another picture from uh, uh, Tanzania. Uh, again, I, I realized that uh, the, the the background was so uh, so gray and without any details, and uh, uh, I I focused on, on a nice foreground and then found this uh, uh, this interesting uh, a tree with uh, 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 pink colors that. Uh, really create this uh, uh, surreal uh, atmosphere. Uh, this is again uh, a double exposure uh, taken at, at the same time uh, with, uh, with lesser flamingos 
uh, still in, um, in Tanzania. Or also this uh, photos still taken in Africa with uh, uh, this uh, uh, textures of uh, trees in the water and the uh, reflection of the sky in the water that looks like uh, uh, the sky actually and the, the flock of birds uh, passing through this is another uh, very abstract uh, uh, photos. Uh, in the last years I also started to, to use drones um, just because uh, it's possible to, to see different point of views with, uh, with drones and uh, this uh, is from um, a flock of fungus in, uh, in Africa from, uh, from last winter and this is a bit higher um, where you, you see the, uh, the flamingos uh, crossing the uh, red muddy waters uh, uh, of the lake in the, in the Rift Valley. And uh, yeah, this looks very, uh, very abstract uh, texture. I really enjoyed this one. But yeah, when, when you talk about surreal uh, places, uh, Namibia is another very uh, nice location because you have this. Uh, um, this uh, flat uh, uh, barren land in the Atosha National Park and uh, you uh, isolate the, uh, the animal and uh, at the same time to uh, create this uh, uh, really, um, really surreal um, atmosphere because it's really uh, unusual to, to see a giraffe or in your mind probably you don't imagine to, to see a giraffe in, in such an environment. And uh, yeah, as I said, I like paintings and uh, this uh, heavy uh, snowfall in, uh, in front of this uh, uh, Uber Swan in, in Hokkaido is another, another image that I truly, uh, truly enjoy. It's, uh, it's not one of my most popular photos, but it's actually uh, one of my favorite. I truly like the, the background of the tree, the, the, the texture, barely visible of the trees with the, uh, the snowflakes and the, and the swan. And these are more uh, more famous locations like Namibia, still very good for surreal landscape uh, details. Um, I I wanted to, to focus on the on this walking bear, uh, and uh, I tried to use a very slow shutter speed, and uh, I was lucky enough to. A sharp photo of uh, the bear standing still for a fraction of a second to uh, when it was fishing for for salmon. So I like the details of this post. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, minimalism, but uh, yeah, these two these two swans uh, combine quite a lot uh, concerning the uh, the environment. This uh, mist in the in the background and uh, uh, this is a completely blue uh, background with only the two white uh, birds uh, standing in front of it. And this is, now I want to, I'm almost uh, finish my, my presentation. I want just to show you some, a uh, few more images with uh, nice moments in, in nature, uh, sometimes from Hokkaido in Japan, one of my <clears throat> most favorite uh, location, uh, some backlit photos in, uh, in Alaska. And uh, these are more regular photos that uh, any photographer without uh, a specific purpose of, or a specific project could, uh, could take. Uh, this was a cheetah with seven, seven cups, uh, probably one of the <laughs> record in, uh, in nature. Uh, photograph last year in Kenya, or a splashing puff in in, uh, in Alaska. From this image is quite old, almost ten years old. A very lucky moment. And uh, yeah, as I said, I like the, the interaction of species. Uh, what you see in the background is uh, uh, is a red crown crown crane, which is a critically endangered bird. Uh, so I really enjoyed the two, the two foxes fighting just in front of this uh, of these birds in the background. 
or this uh, this is a sea tur turtle in um, Hawaii. Um, this is another interesting behavior observed, which uh, which probably uh, reflects some uh, some changes in the climate. But it's a quite a long story, so I don't want to uh, take too much time to to talk about this. But it's uh, it's an interesting nature story. Uh, not a big fan of uh, underwater shots. I tried a few, uh, but then I realized that there are too many uh, super good photographers there, and I wasn't good enough to to do this kind of uh, of photos. Uh, yeah, some more some more bears, some more uh, environment. Uh, you see the the three birds in in the foreground, and. Uh, the, the autumn colors in, in the background, the, the bear sleeping, preparing for, for hibernation. So again, it's quite interesting uh, behavior here. Uh, yeah, whenever possible, uh, wide angles photo are, are my favorite. And uh, you see this, uh, this lioness here, just uh, next to the road in, um, in a very nice position for, for using a wide angle. So whenever, Whenever you see the opportunity, uh, I always, whenever I see the opportunity, I always consider uh, using a wide angle. I say, why not try and see what happens. And uh, there is also another nice place in Svalbard where you can combine uh, wildlife to uh, architectural photography. Um, this is an old uh, uh, Russian, it was actually a Soviet city, uh, Pyramiden that was used for uh, taking coal. There were mines in this area. But uh, about 20 years ago, uh, this uh, uh, city was completely abandoned. And now it's, uh, it's quite common to, to photograph wildlife uh, between these uh, uh, ruins. And it's, uh, it's a very special mood. It's also a nice uh, uh, background opportunities to um, to combine wildlife with uh, uh, with background, uh, the, the very few photos uh, just to show you the, the backstage of um, of my work. Uh, it's a uh, it's a very nice uh, experience to to be outside usually, but uh, especially in some areas it can be also quite uh, challenging. Uh, here it's uh, in the snowmobile uh, experience in the Arctic with uh, winds blowing at uh, almost 120 kilometers an hour at uh, minus 20. <laughs> it's a very, very, very bad experience. And this is what you can see when riding a snowmobile in this condition, which is uh, basically nothing. <laughs> so it's quite challenging. Uh, sometimes uh, you need to sleep in tents uh, on snow, which is not fun. Uh, sometimes the gear uh, has some problems. Uh, it's exposed to extremely low temperature, sometimes to very high and humid environments, sometimes to salty environments. So yes, it's also always uh, difficult to, to work uh, on the field and on some environments. And this is the, the picture of my tent in, in Norway when I photographed the mask oxen, oxen uh, very cold experience. So uh, I think this is my, my presentation. And as I said, I'm available to answer any kind of questions you might have or to go back to some images if you want to, to see something more. And uh, yeah, I'm done here with this uh, last photo of the uh, Alaskan environment, another place that I truly like in, in autumn colors. Marco, thank you very, very much for that. Uh, there's lots of comments coming in uh, from people and basically they're saying it was absolutely fantastic presentation, uh, stupendous photographs, absolutely wonderful. I think everybody really, really enjoyed um, what they've seen here this evening from you. So many, many thanks for that. Uh, some questions have come in uh, in the chat facility um, and um, one uh, person was asked, the conditions during your when you were taking your photographs and I wonder how 
um, how many troubles you experienced due to the very bad conditions which which were there at the time. Yeah, it's uh, it depends. Sometimes you you expect a very difficult condition. Sometimes uh, actually uh, you expect the worst, but it's not so bad. And other times uh, it can be dangerous when you think it's safe. Uh, I'm, I'm basically a wildlife photographer. So the most uh, difficult thing is to deal with uh, wildlife uh, because uh, it's easy to predict the environment. Uh, so you can, if it's cold, you can uh, buy clothes, so you can dress properly. Uh, it's more difficult when you have to sleep outside or stay hours outside like in Svalbard. Uh, Svalbard is a very extreme condition in winter. Uh, because uh, to reach to some areas when we uh, photograph bears, uh, you have to stay out for at least 13 hours. And uh, 13 hours uh, driving a snowmobile at 100 kilometers an hour to, to get there for three hours. And uh, temperatures dropping at uh, the minimum was minus 36 one, one day. So it was... Uh, it can be really hard, but uh, that's something you can predict. Uh, approaching wildlife is uh, is more complicated. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the best thing with, with wildlife is just uh, sit and wait, uh, because it's very difficult that, to do the first move. It's easier to show yourself to the animal and see if the animal is curious and wants to check who you are. When this works, it's uh, really, uh, really good for for taking uh, uh, wildlife photos using uh, short lenses. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work always, but uh, th the best photos are uh, using adopting this this strategy. So stress for wildlife and just wait. So that's that's something which I think a number of people are asking questions. I think they were surprised at the fact that you're using these wide angle lenses, uh, like sixteen millimeter and so on. Uh, and I mean, what is it that prompted you to, to make the decision to do that? Well, uh, usually I try. So, um, you know, uh, I have a very good uh, um, Norwegian photographer. He's a very famous guy. And he always said to me, just go for gold because there are already too many good images of everything. So, if you feel there is an opportunity to do something, try to do that. And uh, most of the times you put uh, the, uh, the wide lens and uh, you, you cannot use it because simply you don't get close enough. Mm -hmm. But always be ready for this because uh, if, if the situation happens, then it's good. It's not just about uh, the focal lens. Sometimes it's about composition. I, I show you the picture of the two bears. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, if you have something in your mind, that try, try to, to do that because mm -hmm. the, the regular pictures are already, uh, have already been seen everywhere. And the fact that you're using these wide angle lenses, somebody was asking the question, does that not put your, either yourself or the animals in danger? Uh, of course, you cannot do that with any animal. And uh, you, can, you cannot do that with dangerous animals unless you are in a car. And even if you are in a car, you cannot just uh, drive straight to the animal because uh, otherwise you will photograph the, the back of the animal. Uh, when the, the situation is safe, uh, like for example, with the gelada baboons, um, the, the, the best to do is to, to sit down and wait because uh, most of the animals are extremely curious. So when they realize that you're not dangerous, they want to come close and check what you are. Uh, I have, uh, I've, I've had experience with uh, monkeys touching me to, to see what I was. And uh, so you just uh, stand still, don't do anything, and uh, they, will, they will investigate. Uh, this also works very well for Arctic wildlife. Arctic wildlife uh, is not used to seeing any people because they, there are so few tourists there that they probably haven't seen anyone before you. So uh, maybe at first they are a bit scared, they run away, but then they usually come back. This works for, very well for polar bears, especially for young bears, 
but uh, it also works with seals. It works very well with walrus. Very, very curious animal. And does that, I mean, because you're getting so close to the animals, does that not put them a little bit at risk of becoming too familiar with humans? Uh, well, it depends on where you are and it depends on if uh, there can be a real risk for, for the animal. Uh, if you are in a protected environment uh, with no risk for poaching, uh, it's not uh, dangerous that uh, for for the animal to to trust in people. But there are some some places uh, where it is good that they they stay away from people. So it's all about knowledge. Uh, it's better having a local guide that uh, explains the situation, that knows how to approach, uh, when you can approach, when you cannot approach. Um, you discuss with him uh, uh, a strategy. So uh, usually uh, you, you don't go just by yourself and try to, to touch the animals. That would be completely stupid. Mm -hmm. And then how close can you get the polar bears? You, you mentioned there about the cubs, you can get close to them. But what, what about the adult bears? Well, um, it's, uh, it depends on the place. Uh, in Svalbard, on land, it is forbidden to approach bears. So even if they are one kilometer away, you cannot approach. Uh, when, they, when the bear decides to approach you, it is safe uh, until about 200 meters. So the images you have seen of bears on the ice and the uh, uh, winter colors uh, with uh, orange mountains are from about uh, 150 to 200 meters away. Uh, in the summertime, uh, you're on a boat and uh, basically from a boat, you can be quite close, mm -hmm. like uh, six, seven, eight meters. So it's, uh, it's easier. So in that case, I presume when you're like 100, 200 meters away, I presume you're using a longer uh, yes. focal length lens. Yeah, 600 millimeters usually. Yeah. Um, Sharon was asking the question about your backlit photographs. Uh, and do you have any advice for uh, camera settings and composition uh, for those particular type of images? Uh, well, I'm... I'm, I usually I shoot uh, with uh, a priority on aperture because I want to be in complete control of the depth of field. Uh, so most of my pictures, uh, I fix the aperture and the while shooting, I keep an eye on the time. I keep, keep the eyes on the time. If, if it's okay, I keep the aperture, otherwise I change it because mm -hmm. uh, in most of my work, uh, the depth of field makes the difference. Sometimes you want a lot, sometimes you don't want. So I want to completely control it. But uh, yeah, if you if you begin with wildlife photography, it's better to to keep an eye on time because it's uh, easier to get blurred images. Or uh, yeah, controlling time is a, is a good way to start. Yeah, yeah. But, but I prefer to to work on the aperture actually. Um, Sultan has sent in a, a question. He's, uh, he's saying he's seen some fantastic images from you this evening from far away places, Africa and Asia and the Arctic areas. Do you take any photographs in Europe? And what's the difference between an exotic place like the Arctic and the European environment where maybe the animals are not quite as, as extravagant or as extraordinary? Yeah, I usually I do not take photos in Europe. Um, well, sometimes I took photos in Norway, but um, in wild places. Um, I, I, talking about Italy um, and talking about uh, my my own region, uh, I tried that, but uh, we still have um, quite uh, important uh, hunting pressure. So uh, animals uh, uh, are really uh, really afraid of humans. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite difficult for me to, to get this kind of pictures uh, where you need to have the animal completely relaxed uh, and I don't want to, to stay in hide and wait. I just want to have this direct way of, of approaching one, which is uh, more flexible. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Kev was just asking a question as well. Um, what equipment do you use and and in particular when you're in the very cold environments how do you keep it safe from from that environment uh well about the equipment i 
I'm using both Sony and Canon. I, I was a Canon photographer. I've been using Canon for many years, but uh, recently I began using Sony and uh, I think there are a few lenses that uh, are very, very good for, for wildlife, like the two to 600 Sony is, uh, is truly amazing. So for long lenses, this uh, two to 600, which is the only uh, long lens I'm using now. I previously had some fixed lens. I still have some, but uh, uh, I found this uh, extremely useful. And uh, on the contrary, for wide angles, I use the uh, Canon lens at the moment. And about uh, protecting the gear, uh, Usually I do not protect the gear. I just, uh, there's not much you can do with uh, cold environments when you stay out for hours. It's uh, just minus 30 and uh, you rely on the batteries. Usually modern cameras are much better than older models. And I've also traveled with friends and never had problems related to cold environments. It's more difficult when it's too humid. Uh, Again, uh, motor cameras are usually quite good against the water splashing and humidity, but uh, sometimes, uh, you know, some, sometimes uh, something doesn't work. But uh, yeah, not the big problems. Uh, I had a bad experience with a brown bear uh, three years ago. I, just, I fell into a river with all my gear and had to swim to, to get off the river. And uh, anyway, all, all, the, all my gear went underwater and up, and everything was OK. So <laughs> very good. <laughs> you are very, very good. lucky. Yes. yes. Um, Elaine is asking a question about how do you find local guides that will cater for photographers? I just uh, searched the, the web. Just uh, it's uh, usually they are not. Uh, uh, they are not. Ex they, they have no experience with photographers, but uh, they have experience with nature. So when we are on the field, we can discuss a little bit. Uh, and uh, if they have a positive attitude, it's uh, it's easy to get what you what you want. Okay, uh, I think I've uh, covered mm -hmm. all the questions that people have sent in. Just one question from from myself, which is, what's next for you? I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm waiting. I like anyone. So I was quite lucky this last summer. I, I managed to travel twice to, to Svalbard. Uh, so it, I think it was very, I was very lucky. I had uh, this possibility because they had this, uh, this cruise ship that was pretty, pretty much empty. And uh, a friend of mine was, uh, was a guide there and he said, you want to come? And I said, okay, why not? But uh, next, uh, yeah, I have some, some ideas, but uh, of course uh, it's difficult to make any kind of prediction at the moment. Yeah, COVID is causing problems for everybody. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, uh, Marco, thank you very, very much for that. Uh, I